Today, I'm going to try and do something that I don't think has been done before. I'm going to try to create a healthcare data analyst roadmap. Now, it's impossible to be an expert in everything in healthcare. There's so many different places that you can work and so many different types of data. So I'm going to try and simplify things a little bit and hone in on the most common type of data analyst in healthcare. And that's data analysts that work directly with patient or clinical data to improve the outcomes of patients in a hospital or clinic. Let's get started. The first step in this process is step zero. And in this step, you're just trying to figure out if data analytics in healthcare is right for you. There's just two questions that you need to figure out here. The first question is, what do data analysts in healthcare even do? The second question is, does this seem like something I would want to do for a living? I won't spend a ton of time talking about this because I have videos about these subjects already, and I'll drop those in the description below. But at a high level, my work typically consists of meeting with managers of various service lines to figure out their requirements for a report. Then I'll write some code in SQL to pull up a data set, and then I'll plug that data into a data visualization tool like Tableau or Power BI to make sense of that data. The work that me and other analysts do in healthcare is really rewarding because it improves patient lives, it's an industry that's growing really rapidly, the pay is really good, and it's super fun, but it's not without its pain points. Healthcare has many rules and regulations, so you can expect to see tight deadlines every now and then, and there's a lot to learn when you're first starting out. So once you've weighed the pros and cons, we can proceed to step one, which is developing your hard skills. This phase is all about developing the technical skills that you need to hit the ground running when you become a data analyst. The two tools that I personally use the most in my job are SQL and Tableau or Power BI. Just about every hospital is going to have a database of some sort where they store patient data, survey data, research data, among other things. SQL is the tool that you use to query that data out of the database. There's tons of free resources out there for you to learn SQL online, but my favorite resource is sqlzoo.net. I will also be releasing videos in the near future about how to set up your own SQL database on your own computer. After you understand the basics of SQL, you should move on to learning a data visualization tool like Tableau or Power BI. You use data visualization to take raw data and transform that into graphs, tables, figures, dashboards, things that will basically make sense of your data. And this is the part that I love the most. Between Tableau and Power BI, personally, I prefer Tableau because I think it's easier to use, but Power BI is also great too. I actually already have a couple of Tableau tutorials on my channel already, including a tutorial where I cover how to build an emergency room dashboard. So check that out if you haven't already. The other tool that you're gonna need to know is Excel. It's sort of like the Swiss army knife of data analytics in that it does just a little bit of everything. Just about anyone that works with data knows how to use Excel, and you can do a lot of things with it like basic data analysis to creating graphs. At the very least, you should know how to build some basic graphs in Excel, and also know how to build if statements, pivot tables, and also how to use aggregate functions like sum or count. Now you might be thinking, Josh, what about R? What about Python? Well, here's the thing about these programming languages. These tools are great for doing a wide variety of things like doing advanced data visualization that you couldn't do in Tableau or Power BI, doing predictive analytics, automating certain processes. But in my eight years being a data analyst in healthcare, I don't really use Python or R very often. When I'm not in meetings, I'll probably spend 60% of my time in SQL, 25% of my time in Tableau, 10% of my time in Excel, and maybe 5% of my time in Python. And that's a really generous estimate. When I have used Python or R in my work, it's been for things like importing Excel files into SQL, forecasting patient volumes using machine learning, or creating data pipelines that move data from one environment to another, a process called ETL. These use cases are pretty rare for me, and the majority of my data analyst colleagues are not that familiar with Python or R. But if you do eventually learn them, you will be assigned to some really cool projects in your career. So it's definitely worth pursuing, but for now, I want you to focus on SQL, Excel, and Tableau. I would learn Python or R after you've landed 
the job and started to get really comfortable with those three tools that I mentioned. Now you might be asking, how do I know when I'm ready to succeed in a data analyst role? Well, I would say that you're ready when you can start developing your own portfolio entries unprompted by tutorials. Now, tutorials can be really great when you're trying to build your foundational skills, but at some point you need to build them on your own. And when you can do that, that's when you're ready. This leads me to step number two. I want you to build a Tableau or Power BI portfolio of at least three items. It would be ideal if you could find some subjects that are relevant to public health or healthcare. If you're not sure where to start, I do have a video where I talk about some of my favorite data sets that are relevant to the industry, as well as some portfolio ideas to get you started. So check that out if you haven't already. Now what you can do to make these portfolio entries even better is if you can incorporate SQL into those Tableau or Power BI dashboards in some way. And I recommend this because you're going to be doing this all the time as a data analyst. But if you don't know how to combine those two things yet, that's okay. I'm going to have more videos about that in the future. Now, before we go any further, I do have an exciting announcement to make. I'm going to be working on two courses where I teach you the skills that you need to become a data analyst in healthcare. I'm going to be developing this on a website over the next several months. If you want to know when those classes will become available, or if you have feedback for what I should include in those courses, send me an email. I'm going to leave my address in the description down below. After you build your portfolio, I want you to move on to building some domain knowledge in healthcare. And I don't care if you're a clinician or someone who studied public health in school, or maybe you have no background at all in healthcare. I still want you to build domain knowledge. The first and easiest way you can do that is by subscribing to my channel because I'm going to have so much more content like this in the future. But for now, I'm going to give you a study guide on some of the most essential things that you should know. For each of my recommendations, I'm going to drop a link in the description below. But as you're learning these things, just keep in mind that you don't have to be an expert in these things. In fact, I have plenty of colleagues that got data analyst roles in healthcare without any prior healthcare experience or knowledge. But it will be a little bit easier for you to land a job if you're at least a little conversant in some of these subjects. First up is healthcare coding concepts. You should be aware that in hospitals or clinics, Patients are often going to be diagnosed using something called an ICD-10 CM code. So if you go to the doctor and you have a fever, you might be assigned the ICD-10 code R50.9, which represents a fever. And if that fever was the result of something like mononucleosis, then you might get an additional ICD-10 code like B27.90. It's not uncommon for a single patient to generate hundreds or thousands of these codes throughout their lifetime, so do not try to memorize any of these. Just be aware that this is a thing in healthcare and that data analysts like me will use ICD-10 codes to figure out the volume of patients for certain medical conditions. There's other codes that I often use in healthcare like ICD-10 PCS, which are procedure codes in the inpatient or hospital setting. There's CPT codes, and there's other codes that I'll list here, but I very rarely use them, if at all. The next thing that I want you to be familiar with is basic concepts in healthcare quality. I looked at dozens of postings for data analyst positions in healthcare, and more than half of them talk about either quality or process improvement somewhere in the description of that job. Let's talk about that. The sole reason that healthcare exists is to treat its patients. It used to be that healthcare institutions were run like a machine, where every service that was rendered for the patient was rewarded financially, and quality and patient safety was, meh, nah, more of an afterthought. That trend has now been shifting over the past couple of decades where healthcare institutions are penalized for care that does not meet certain standards. So now healthcare quality is being tracked just about everywhere to some extent. And there are hundreds if not thousands of metrics that are being developed to track healthcare quality. So rather than knowing all of these metrics, which is impossible, what I want you to do instead is learn these fundamental concepts in healthcare quality. You should be aware of SEPTI, which is a model for healthcare quality, and what that stands for is patient care is safe, efficient, patient-centric, timely, effective, and equitable. This is also known as the six domains of healthcare quality, and usually my reports are going to be influenced by at least one of those domains. You should also be aware of Donna Bedian's model. The idea behind this is that quality metrics in healthcare can often be lumped into one of three categories. You have structure measures, process measures, and outcomes.
outcome measures. Structure deals with the resources or training that is available within the hospital. For example, have our surgeons been trained on the proper technique to prepare our patients for surgery? These structure measures are going to influence your process measures. Process measures look at how often or how closely did we follow evidence-based guidelines that will influence the outcome measures. So for example, how often did a surgeon give a patient antibiotics prior to surgery so that they don't develop a surgical site infection later on? And finally, outcome measures are the direct result of some process that we're trying to follow. We either want to increase the outcome measure if the thing is good or decrease the outcome measure if the thing is bad. So continuing with this example, the thing that we're trying to reduce is surgical site infections as our outcome measure. Check out the articles that I posted in the description below. If you want to explore healthcare quality more deeply, here's two more resources that you can check out. There's the IHI Open School, which is completely free if you have a .edu email account or if you're a resident of one of these countries. Now, if you don't qualify for that free edition of the IHI Open School, then what I would recommend instead is checking out this class on udemy.com. Now, besides quality, the other buzzword that shows up a lot in data analyst positions in healthcare is knowledge of metrics or metric building. Metrics are how we measure how good our care is in a hospital or a clinic. But as I mentioned already, there's just so many of them. So here's some common ones that you should know about. There's ALOS or the average length of stay, which measures how many days on average did our patients stay in the hospital or any particular department? You have patient census, which measures the number of patients that occupy a hospital bed in a certain department or area at midnight. You have readmission rates, which measures the number of patients that came back to the hospital, typically for reasons that are unplanned, HAIs or hospital acquired infections. And like that sounds, this is a situation where a patient develops an infection while they are in the hospital. This might be things like catheter-associated urinary tract infections, or maybe the patient develops pneumonia from their ventilator, which is called a ventilator-associated event. And another one is adverse drug events, where patients are given the wrong dosing of a medication or the wrong type of medication. I'll cover these things in separate videos, but for now, check out the links that I provide in the description below. One last piece of advice I have is to read anything by Atul Gawande. Gawande is a famous surgeon and writer who writes about a variety of different issues in healthcare, including patient safety and quality issues, end-of-life care, COVID-19, and current healthcare trends as well. You can find many of his articles on newyorker.com, and he has a lot of excellent books that I'm going to recommend in the description down below. So now we are at the final step of my roadmap, and that is landing a job. And as you know, that's going to be harder than that sounds. I have a video where I describe what you need to do to get ready for this. So check that video out if you haven't already. But I'm going to summarize my process here. When you apply for jobs, you could try your luck by going to indeed.com or Glassdoor, but this is probably the least effective way to find a job nowadays. Instead, you should be networking. Think of all of the people that you know and try to connect with them on LinkedIn. And I don't care who they are or where they work, you should be connecting with everyone that you know. Friends, family, people you went to school with, professors in college, your barber, your butcher, your football coach. Connect with as many people as you know, at least a little bit, because the chances are one of them either works directly with healthcare data or they know somebody that works with healthcare data. And when you find the people that do work with healthcare data, you should request an informational interview. To figure out who these people are, go to linkedin.com, type in the name of the healthcare organization that you want to work for. Under people, you're gonna see these three buttons that say first, second, and third. The first contacts are the people that you already know and are connected with on LinkedIn. So if you see anybody under that first button, reach out to them and request an informational interview. If you don't have any first contacts, click on the second button to see if you have any second contacts. These are people that your first contacts are connected with. Figure out who those second contacts are and then reach out to the first contact to see if they would be willing to introduce you and if that person would be willing to give you an informational interview. Then take that opportunity to ask that person for guidance about how to become a data analyst in healthcare. Doing this process will not only give you more ideas about how to become a data analyst in healthcare, but it will also gently hint to that person that you want a job where they work. If you leave a good impression on that person, 
they might end up referring you to a job opening at that organization. When you're done with that informational interview, ask that person if they know of anyone else that you could reach out to. This is gonna take a while, but eventually you will get your first interview, and this is how I actually got my first job. Now, I threw a lot at you, so if you are overwhelmed or you're not quite sure where to start, I've got a playlist here that you can explore that talks about data analytics and healthcare, and I have lots of more videos coming out in the future. So check that out if you haven't already. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in another video.